Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to sport our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. This is The Next Reel, everybody. I'm Pete Wright, and that there is Andy Nelson. Yo, yo, yo. And we spoil movies. Tonight on the show, we're leg breakers right alongside our man Stallone in this 1976 classic, Rocky. Rocky, do you believe that America is the land of opportunity? Yeah. Apollo Creed does. And he's going to prove it to the whole world by giving an unknown a shot at the title. I need your help about 10 years ago, right? 10 years ago, you never helped me. You didn't care. Well, if you wanted help, I say, if you wanted help, why didn't you ask? Why didn't you just ask me again? Look, I asked, but you never heard nothing. Nobody's ever gone the distance with Creed. And if I can go that distance, seeing that bell rings and I'm still standing, I weren't just another bum from the neighborhood. <laughs> All right, Andy, as we have said on the show in the past, I snuck this series onto our schedule. You had, uh, you didn't even notice it until it was too late. It was too late. <laughs> it had been cemented. It was locked. It and was uh, here we are. I have 
a uh, I, I really I, I love this character. I don't know why. Uh, maybe it just was the right time in my life that I uh, saw these movies. I have a great connection to to Rocky. I don't even like boxing. Like I'm not a I, it's not a thing, but I do uh, adore these movies. And I recognize that uh, I am an apologist for a lot of things. And I tried to look at this movie uh, in, in particular as an award winning movie, as a movie that Stallone wrote, uh, as as a movie that is uh, generally uh, deeply appreciated uh, critically, I think. Uh, I tried to look at it critically myself and get past my own just uh, love for it and my experience watching it. And I, I hope that comes through. Um, I found some things that I, I don't think I'd ever noticed the way that I've noticed them this time. And uh, um, and uh, some things that don't work uh, as as well as they probably should in a movie like this. Um, and um, that that didn't change my rating at all. Uh, but, uh, but it did, uh, you know, it did make me look at the movie a little bit differently. And so I hope that comes across in our conversation and that I'm just not a fawning fanboy for rock. Um, uh, because I know that <laughs> will come through in later movies, uh, <laughs> that, that maybe don't earn it even as well. So, uh, we'll see, uh, how did it hit you, uh, this time around? I don't remember when I first saw Rocky. I feel like it was one of those movies that I ended up watching. I, you know, boxing movies were never a thing that um, was something that my dad would take me to. I just don't think he was interested. And uh, so I was never really that interested in in boxing films either. And it was something that I came to much later. And in fact, I probably watched Rocky back in college when I first started um, looking at best picture nominees or best, best picture winners specifically. I think I started going back and trying to catch up on best picture winners that I'd never seen before. And I probably watched this at that time and I ended up really enjoying it. I think it's a, it's a great representation of, uh, seventies filmmaking, the character styles, the realism, um, everything about it had a great, a great feel to it. It's it's a boxing film that is really about the character. And I really appreciated that because I enjoy this character, Rocky Balboa. And I and kind of enjoy this journey that he goes on. And I enjoy that it's even in the scope of of sports films, which generally end with the kind of the big celebratory moment at the end with the victory. I find that it ends in a much different way where he isn't really going to going into this final um, this final um, moment of the film, the, the climactic fight to win. He's going in with totally different motivations. And I I really respect that that is the way that this film went, because it's less about being number one. And it became more about um, sticking through and 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 just you know fighting through everything. And to that end, I I really appreciated it. I found it to be a very uh, touching character story, and I, I enjoy these characters quite a bit. Like you, yes, I um, I do find that I have issues with some of the elements in the film, but largely, it's a really enjoyable movie, and it's it certainly is a great start to uh, this journey that we're going to take on as we go through the uh, the entire franchise. Well, this is promising. I, I have to tell you, I I am I'm pleased to hear that that is your uh, your initial take on this thing, um, because I don't know what I expected. I expected you to just you know be a curmudgeon for curmudgeon's <laughs> sake, I guess, for the next eight weeks. <laughs> yeah, for the next eight weeks. Yeah, uh, but uh, no, I'm delighted by that. I because this is this is great. What's interesting? I watched it with my kids, and they did. They were not keen on it, uh, and I think it's because they understand Rocky to be boxing movies, and this is not. I, I think it's a stretch even to call this a boxing movie. It's it's a uh, it's a character drama that takes place in the world of boxing. I think that's mm -hmm. how I would I would better define it. Yeah. Yeah. Because we only get in terms of of major milestone, you know, boxing events. We have two. We have the one that opens the movie with Rocky in the ring. And uh, that's I, I would argue is not even about the boxing. Uh, but more about the the culture of boxing and the kinds of people who are watching the kinds of boxing that he was doing at the time. Uh, and then there's the big event at the end. But in the middle, we, it's training. It's it's montage. It's family. 
It's uh, it's work. It's him trying to, you know, come to terms with where he is in the sports economy versus the, you know, the economy of Philadelphia at the time uh, and, and the work that he was doing. It's it's a movie about uh, shame. It, it's a movie about, um, you know, trying to find uh, connective relationships. Uh, and uh, it, it's not, a, you know, it, it it's not an exciting boxing movie it's not like a sports movie where we move from event to event to event and we get more of that later in the series but uh, but that's not this movie and i think that's why that's one of the reasons that this movie i think was such oscar bait right that it, it um, um that it told a different kind of story about a different kind of athlete and um i i really appreciated that and largely was incredibly inspiring i mean i think yeah. that's um, a very big element to the success of the film is just how inspiring it is. I mean, it's so inspiring yeah. that the city it takes place in has erected a statue of this fictional character atop the stairs <laughs> that he yeah. that right. he goes up. I mean, that's how inspiring this film is. It became representative of of any person, especially in, you know, kind of uh, uh, kind of the the lower middle class, just working hard to achieve their dreams. And uh, I think that uh, it, it, it fit very well with the climate and what people were kind of wanting to see at the time. It's 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 a very inspiring film. Um, yeah, so, it is. Yeah. It, the whole message of you don't have to win to win. Right. Yeah. I mean, he the he, he you know, will say I, I, he didn't lose the match. It was called as a split decision at the end. But that's not what you expect from a big uh, inspiring sports movie. And yet at the end, as he's got Adrian in his arms and the lights are around him and everybody's, you know, all the expectations have been completely blown. Uh, you know, he he won. Yeah, because because he went 15 rounds, which nobody ever thought he would. I mean, even Creed said all, oh, you know, I'll win by the end of the third round. Right. And here's this this young upstart uh, who takes him a full 15 rounds. And by the end of it, uh, you know, has really proven himself a, a worthy opponent. I love the I love the feeling of this movie. I love the feeling of the city that that we're in. You know, I love the row housing and the the production design, particularly in his depart his apartment. Um, it's it's just uh, you know it's a it, it's a pretty grimy place, and there are these weird knives sticking out of all the <laughs> walls, and I don't understand that. Uh, and there are a lot of things that uh, you know that they don't. Uh, they don't suffer us through the time of explaining all the little touches, the production touches. Uh, and, and I appreciate that. I appreciate that. They just really are focusing on, on him and his existence. Don't we see him when, and I, I may be misremembering it, but when he's talking, when, when, um, uh, uh, Burgess Meredith pops into his place as the uh, you're wanting to train him uh, as mm -hmm. Mickey and he's talking to him, trying to pitch him. Doesn't, um, uh, Rocky get mad and throw a knife into the wall or am, am I just totally misremembering that because for some reason that was in my head and I'm like well that's why the knives are in the wall but maybe it's because maybe I put that in my head because of that I don't remember you know that. I don't remember I know he throws something but yeah. I didn't catch if it was a knife that yeah. seems like a weird thing for me to have missed but I, I think you're right but that doesn't what that doesn't explain to me is the is one step earlier why does he have all these knives Right. Well, like, why what does he is leave the... them? <laughs> like, yeah, that's the other right. Thing. Exactly. And and there's one. Obviously, there's some functional reality of the knives, which is he's like he's always hanging his hat on one of them right <laughs> by the mirror. And so there's a there's utility there. I don't know what else he does. But it just seemed like a, a strange thing to keep everywhere. And he's he really destroys that apartment with the way he lives in it. Uh, and the fact that, uh, you know, he's that through his just weird charm, he's able to get Talia Shire, Shire to. Uh, hang with him in that apartment and <laughs> it's just fantastic um and, and that he as a character shows no shame in you know the way he lives like that gives us a um i think it would be the easy road to have this character who knows he lives in uh the dumps uh to feel shame about living in the dumps and i like that he doesn't right i mean i i don't think he's bringing home like the the girl from the other side of the tracks or anything when right. he brings tally over but right but still, I, I think you're right. It's, uh, you know, he, he has no problem with, uh, with kind of the whole vibe of his life. Right. But it's, there's something super charming about him. I mean, here's this yes. guy who is an animal lover, you know, and, and part of that is like in my head, I'm like, is he an animal lover because um, Adrian works at the pet shop and he just wants to keep buying things because he wants to spend more time there with her? Or was he naturally an animal lover and that just ended up kind of coinciding and working really well? The way that he treats the animals, I like to think that it's the latter. 
and that he just really loves them and he's got these turtles and he's got these fish and he ends up with a dog and it's just it's super adorable to have yeah. this this kind of this lummox of a character who uh works for kind of a local uh, uh, a local numbers man uh, as his as uh, his muscle and has to break people's fingers and all that when they don't pay. I, I just I was like, he's he's kind of this sweetie. And even he doesn't want to break people's fingers when he has to and gives them other chances when he shouldn't. And it's it's it, that's really a part of this movie that I really had completely forgotten about. And so as the story was progressing, I'm like, this is a character that I really like. I just like this gentle nature of this guy. And um, I thought that was a really interesting element that uh, Stallone wrote into the character. I, I do, too. And and to that point about him being an animal lover, I always like bought that, that he was an animal lover first, because why would this big, you know, lummox, as you say, why would he even go into the pet store uh, yeah, right. and, and meet this woman? Uh, if he wasn't already into animals, you know, and and so I, um, boy, I just really, uh, uh, really loved that the nature of that uh, relationship that he has, um, you know, with with the world around him, and you know, his dog that uh, you know that he has such a great connection with that dog every time he goes in. I think is just uh, really cool. Just going along with the whole vibe of the film. This is just a random little note, but. The film starts off with the title and it is a giant title and it scrolls across the entire screen. You can't even fit the entire word on it. It's I and then you have the title later, which I thought was an interesting choice. But I thought it was a really interesting way to start the film that just like announced its presence big and yeah. bold and said, check me out. Rocky. Yeah, I was like that. That was such a, a great way to begin the film especially for this character who's not already like uh the second um the second best boxer in the world who's fighting for the championship yeah. you know it's like you get this huge title and then here is this guy who's kind of a low end boxer working on the streets well it's an aspirational title isn't it right yeah, like it feels absolutely. to me very much like a like a title card at a at a boxing match right that you'd yeah. see the uh the woman walk out with the card right that's yeah. the the image and i th i think that really works it's, uh, it's great i i loved it that uh, starting it that way i'm like this that was a great way to start this film i wasn't expecting it and uh i just i thought it was fantastic yeah um it, you know it's interesting that opening sequence too in the ring right uh, where you know he's he's fighting he's fighting this you know it's a i, I don't even know how what you call it uh at at that tier of boxing uh, I don't even know what the words are. That's how disconnected I am from boxing. But it's it's <laughs> not both, one of man. these pre premier matches, whatever that that would be. Uh, and it, you know, I think what that sequence does is, it, you know, it doesn't really highlight the fact that you know Rocky is is this kind of boxer until later in the in the match. But we have a lot of um, a lot of attention paid to the culture around boxing and the people's faces that are screaming with joy and frustration and, uh, you know, money is changing hands and, and we get this this whole tapestry of what the world is like around boxing. I think that does such a wonderful job of of demonstrating the weird conflict that exists in boxing, that it is so violent. Uh, a, a natural sort of exercise of humanity that brings people a lot of joy to watch right they get a lot of satisfaction to watch this expression of violence and i i find that captivating in this series and i think that's one of the reasons why i i like this movie so much is that that sort of meta level of what is it that makes boxing so satisfying for so many people well that's all in the first five minutes of this movie for me that's such a funny thing to point out too because i i mean yeah i always watch those people in movies when it's a boxing movie and i look at these crowds cheering people on i'm like God, who are these people? Yeah. You know, like I could never do that. Like it's such a strange thing to cheer on, you know, like two guys pummeling each other. But uh, I, yeah. I don't know, but it has a huge uh, contingency of fans. It's always interesting to me to kind of see these people just cheering it on. It's such a glad gladiatorial uh element of yeah. our society that still goes on and well, that's uh, exactly the word i would have used for it too andy i think that's that's exactly like right like what is it that you know that this sport connects us straight back to the romans you know <laughs> right
<laughs> right. Except it's not to the death. That's that's the one big <laughs> the one big yeah, difference. That's, <laughs> that's right. Some some of the little things we've shaved off the right. little elements. That's okay. That's okay. Oh man, uh, I'm sure Mike Tyson wouldn't have had a problem with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, th there is an interesting thing about the character, though, that comes out in this uh, uh, opening match, which I think is underplayed in the rest of the movie. At least I don't see it, and I'm curious if you see it elsewhere. Th there's a sequence uh, where he gets cut, right? He gets hit in the head, and he gets cut on his eye, and then he goes bananas. Rocky goes bananas, which actually should have been like Rocky Six. That would have been great. <laughs> <laughs> I had only just came to me now. I swear now to God, I, I did love not the plan double that. Feature. Rocky goes bananas and Herbie goes bananas. <laughs> yeah, the drive-in right. double that's feature. Right. There it is. That's right. Uh, and, and so he goes bananas and he just wails on this guy like he gets his the whole rage monster wakes up and this was the this was the poke the dragon moment right where you have this character and he's unleashing an unseen force of will we did not know he had it it was a vessel that was hidden deep inside him and now he is he has the strength suddenly to win the match and he wins the match but he wins the match by like getting this guy on the ground and like beating him uh, yeah. you know and has to be pulled off of him I was that uh, what was that all about it, to your eye? Because I it confused me. Well, and this is an element of the film that uh, that I do find problematic because it does introduce him as this almost like this berserker character who when something like that happens to him, he just goes crazy and attacks the other opponent. It's never brought up again. Um, the only the time you really see anything like that is when he's talking to Mickey and he throws something at the wall. Um, mm -hmm. as he's getting angry at him, but even then it's not the same. And it's an element of Rocky that, that, uh, for me kind of seemed a little out of nowhere and it ended up kind of creating a false expectation with the character. Cause I was like, well, when's that going to happen again? You know, I had the same, the same read on that, that you did. And because at, after that, he's, he's always determined. He's always helpful. He's always, um, you know, this kind hearted guy who's who's going to give it his all, but he never goes crazy like that. So it's an odd element that they introduce there. And it will be an interesting I mean, you've seen more of the films than I have. But for me, it'll be interesting to see if that's ever brought up again and addressed, because it certainly for me was kind of a, a misstep at right out of the gate with this film. Yeah, I, it it was a confusing thing, and and to your point, you know the 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 moments in between the boxing matches, he is aware of his language. He is. We have this fantastic sequence where he's walking the younger sister of one of his guys he knows. He's he's grabbing her off of the stoop of a store where he sees her smoking and using foul language, and he carries her. He like practically carries her. He walks her home and makes her go inside, even though she's just foul mouth because he he doesn't want her hanging out with undesirables. Right? He is a man of honor. That's one of and, my favorite moments in the film is actually when he's like, you know, and I'm going to say a bad word here, but yeah, a whore. You don't want to be a whore. I'm like that was like. I, it took me aback that this was this guy on the streets who's being sensitive around this young girl uh, to the point where he he's going to say the word horror, but he wants to warn her first. That, that's exactly right. And I, I, I think that's a, a really special part of of the character. And that is the thing, to your point, that, you know, makes the character a little bit unpredictable and not always in a satisfying way. Like, I, I feel like I I want to get to know him the way he's he's being portrayed in front of me and sometimes it, it takes a turn that doesn't always seem fulfilling uh that as this you know if he's this berserker character then we should see that play out and it doesn't play out in this movie instead he's he is the the steady tank and especially in the big climactic fight he's the steady tank um that just keeps going and keeps coming back we don't see him lose his cool the way he does in the beginning right uh, and and maybe that is maybe that's the message, right? Maybe it's the message that he that rage monster thing was was resolved inside of him through his training and fantastic montages. Um, but if that's the case, I, I don't feel like I saw that specifically. Being, well, yeah, you know, and that's handled. exactly was my read on it is like if, if that was something that he was going to have to deal with, we should have seen that in the training. We should have seen Mickey yeah. working with him on that, talking to him about you got to, you know, keep it inside but but find a way to channel yeah. it or something that should have been a part of the training and it wasn't and to that end it was a slip up what do you think of his relationship with uh with Polly how do you feel about Polly as a character Polly's an interesting one um he's he's an interesting friend i i like that um 
I think I actually ended up liking that relationship. Um, I don't want to say more than any of the other relationships in the film, but maybe I, I just found it to be such an interesting friendship and the way that um, that Polly was always trying to get work from from the the uh, numbers guy that the Rocky worked for. And, you know, he was terrible to his sister. I think he was just sick of this this wallflower living with him. Um, and and he just felt like this this kind of this broken guy who. Uh, was really struggling trying to to figure out what to do with his own life and i like that he finally found it with that little marketing bit at the end which i thought was kind of uh cute um again it was a relationship that that never quite was developed as strongly as i felt it should have there was that moment when he comes home and he's kind of uh drunk and and uh you know i can't remember what he says but it's something like i can't I can't work i can't work there anymore or something like that and mm-hmm. i'm like so did he get fired or because you know, I wasn't quite sure exactly what happened there, mm-hmm. um, but it, it felt like something more had happened. And I appreciate that they didn't feel like they had to spell it out, but I could have used just a tiny bit more info. Yeah, I think so, too. Although I, I agree with you. I think Polly is a really interesting character and his rage and the way he he plays his rage, uh, his internal rage. You know, I think Burt Young is it does a terrific sort of seething um, any man uh, that. Uh, I I find really compelling, and when he loses it and b- takes out a baseball bat to his own house, yeah. um, man, that that was just it was explosive and fantastic, and and um, I I really I had a lot of of hope and joy for him. But you know what was interesting about this? I was more into their relationship, right, Rocky and Polly, uh, and and I didn't find that Polly's sort of volcanic performance, that Burt Young's volcanic performance, outshined. Uh, Stallone. I was still into Stallone, and I I kept thinking about that in in the context of Rachel Rachel, where uh, you know we had uh, that wonderful sort of secondary performance um, from Kala, and uh, she just she was the movie I wanted to watch. I kept thinking about it in this context because you have this great performance from Burt Young as a secondary character. You know why would we ever want to watch his story? No, I'm really only interested in his story as he relates to the context of Rocky. And that, that I think pays off in, in uh, movies to come. Uh, so I, this, I thought it was just great. And it made me really look forward to seeing how his relationship with Rocky evolves. Yeah, me too. Okay. So then we get to, uh, Adrian and their love story. Uh, it's, it's a weird love story between weird people. <laughs> that's what it is i was torn with this character um she's so incredibly mousy and timid and shy and um i thought it was a really interesting character and i appreciated that they uh that he's kind of uh got the this this uh this passion for her and and uh is really drawn to her i thought that was Really exciting. I liked that. I liked the way that their relationship came to be. But I also kept asking myself, was it was it just is it change? Is she changing too quickly? Like she was so introverted. This whole story takes place basically about five weeks of time, which we we know from um, that's kind of the the uh, uh, ticking clock we get earlier when Creed Mm -hmm. is talking about this match that he's planning on having. And um and so to a certain extent, I, I OK, five weeks. Sure, I can believe that their relationship has grown to this point over that period of time. But I her character is so mousy and timid that sometimes after they get together, I, I feel like I stop seeing that introverted character and I'm only just seeing her as as kind of uh, maybe not quite the level that we see of her in The Godfather. But certainly she's like a little more like the the introverted side just doesn't seem to be there anymore. And I'm like, did that just disappear? I don't know. Well, I keep trying to think what what would they be trying to communicate for her over these, you know, five weeks. And, you know, we know that Rocky is I think Rocky is set at about 30 years old. So I'm assuming she's she do they ever out her age? I can't I can't recall. I think Polly says something about her age. I can't remember if he actually specifically says it or just, you know, she's an old maid type of thing. Yeah, she's a spinster. Right. Yeah. And so um, so I'm assuming she's around, you know, that age. And uh, so um, my impression of it has always been that what they're demonstrating over these five weeks is that this is a woman who has a voice and it's just, you know, it, it's going to blow up. Right. She just needs someone to unlock it. 
that she has felt, you know, like her brother's had his, you know, his his boot on her neck for too long and that she has she's got something inside her that needs to come out. And it's actually, you know, it's her relationship with Rocky that, um, you know, that that unlocks that door, um, whether or not that that happens effectively in the film is I, I guess is the debatable part but i've always bought that that she was ready she was ready for somebody to to unlock the door for her and, and invite her into a relationship and and demonstrate her voice and um you know it, it didn't it, it didn't feel like it raced for me too quickly okay well then it may just be me it may just be the way that i felt um I mean, and to that you have extent, a problem with lusty fast relationships is what i'm <laughs> apparently no you know what's interesting is i as i think about it i i think it I, I maybe it's because after their relationship begins we never see them in the relationship in context of being around other people other than polly yeah and so we just see kind of their relationship selves but i I, maybe for me it would have helped if there was just one scene where like she was back at work and i felt like she was still the mousy adrian who was too shy to say anything around other people like her boss or anything um that would have helped me go okay so she's still the same person it's just uh you know because we lose seeing that element of her entirely for the rest of the film um, it just, it feels like a character change that might be a little too great for me. Well, interestingly, at the the very final sequence when he's screaming, Adrian, you know, he can't mm-hmm. see. And and, um, you know, we have these these that, that feel to me very intentional, these these intentional close ups on her face as she's deciding whether or not to burst into the crowd yeah. and go to him. Right. Yeah. That's what I see on her face, that she's really trying to figure out, is it me? Am I the person who runs ringside? Right. And and eventually she decides, yes, I am. Well, that that's an interesting moment of character evolution for her. Right. That she yeah, erupts right. and it's in the last 30 seconds of the movie. But it's also a setup for the second movie. Right. Where she gets to be a different character a little bit. And I think that's I think that's really nice, even that they that they give her this opportunity at the time of his big, quote, win. They give her the opportunity to burst through and have a character moment is a nice touch. Yeah, I agree with that. And uh, to that end, I'm looking forward to seeing how her character does evolve over this franchise. Okay, so let's talk about Apollo Creed. This is if I have a problem with the movie, it's in this stuff. Oh, interesting. Okay, there's a foundational element of the movie, right? That it's the this is the accidental lottery winner trope, right? Like I I found the golden ticket, right? It's a golden ticket thing Um, that there was a fight that was scheduled between Apollo Creed and this other guy, Yahoo, serious. And that fight gets canceled because of something. And now we need to find someone else to fight. And that foundation, right, take we're going to pluck an underdog and give him a chance to fight the great is in this movie. It just feels so easy to me. It feels way too easy. And the whole mechanic of getting of finding Rocky, why Rocky is the guy is not sold well enough to me in the audience uh, to make it feel earned and that was a challenge I had this time around that I don't think I have had in the past. And I found it frustrating. Yeah, it's it's almost like flipping through a phone book and pointing your finger at a name. I mean, that's essentially what almost, they do. almost Andy. I mean, literally, that's exactly <laughs> what they did. <laughs> right. He's like, Let's, this one, the Italian stallion. Yeah. That's a name that sounds good. And uh, I don't think the they sold. Uh, said? Oh, the line he they, said they didn't so sell funny. Apollo Creed as well. Like, oh, the Italian. Stallion. They didn't sell him as a, well enough, I think. Um well, maybe they did sell him well enough again as the as the like he's now he's been fighting for so long that he's now more businessman than athlete. Like that's yeah. that's who we get here. That's the archetype. But I just didn't I didn't feel like he was uh, he was the guy to 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 do that. I just didn't buy it. I, I didn't buy it. And I didn't buy the the mechanic between him and the promoter who had been doing all the work. Like, I feel like it would have been more believable for the promoter to say, um, you know, I got somebody. I got somebody that I found and sell uh, Creed on the idea and sell Creed on that. Like that was a that was a, a whole sequence that was out of balance to me that that Creed was the one driving this whole thing. It would have been much more believable if Creed had to be sold into uh, giving this guy a chance. I think that would have been a more interesting character switch for me. Um, 
and uh, and the promoter was an interesting kind of smarmy guy. I think it would have been I think I, I could have bought that. I didn't buy it as it was. It just was too easy. But it gets us into the Rocky Cinematic Universe, which, you know, I can't complain. Yeah, it, I guess for me, it wasn't a huge issue. I thought it was actually pretty interesting that uh, maybe not the methodology, like the flipping through the phone book, the boxing phone book. Apparently there is one and finding <laughs> finding this guy. Uh, I thought it was a, a, a I liked the the concept that, you know, let's bring a young a young guy on and it'll it'll be a big chance for them. It'll still make a lot of news for me. And actually, I really enjoyed this businessman side of Apollo Creed. I thought it was it's another thing that I completely had forgotten about this film. And uh, I thought it was a very interesting way to to take it that uh, that this character has become so big that it really is more about the business for him than it is about um, the boxing. And I, he had a fantastic line, which also I thought was a very just an interesting moment. The fact that he actually tells somebody, forget about sports as a profession. <laughs> I was yeah, like, wow, right. Right. Out yeah, of the, I thought that was mouth. great. Yeah. And that's uh, like when we first meet uh, Apollo Creed, right? It, and that's yeah, like, that's like very movies. early. Right. Yeah. It yeah. was very funny. Very funny. But, you know, Carl Weathers, I think, was great in the role. And I think he actually works really well as this world uh, top boxer who is kind of this businessman guy. And I like the people he has around him, kind of his team. I just I, I liked everything about Apollo Creed. I thought he was a really great character and made for a, a great foil. And I love how the relationship, how he kind of eggs on Rocky a little bit. Um, you know, he's giving this guy a chance, but still boxers are boxers. He's just, he's still going to kind of egg him on a little bit in the, in the press conferences and all that. And I really enjoyed how the relationship uh, shifted during the match, how he started realizing that there's more to this Rocky guy than he thought. And as his one of his uh, his like corner man points out to him, he says, this guy doesn't know that it's just for a show. He's really doing it. That and, was my favorite moment in the film right there. You just you yeah. just highlighted it. Yeah. And it's a great moment for for Creed as he starts to realize that. And he really has to actually start boxing now and defending himself. And he gets cracked ribs. And I, I was just like, wow, this was a great turn and a nice surprise for him to the point that as they're fighting, like he's actually shouting out to him, ain't going to be no rematch. Like, don't expect, you know, don't expect me to be this nice to you again. Yeah. Young punk. I loved all that. What a great, uh, a great bit. So I just loved everything about Creed, except for the way that they picked uh, Rocky. Yeah, I agree. I, as we get later in the film, when it actually comes to the match, I'm I'm really into it. And in fact, I, I really love Carl Weathers in this character. And it is the fact that that he his relationship becomes a, an anchor in the coming, you know, three movies after this is uh, really uh, powerful for the character i think they do some interesting and fun things with him um and and so once we get past that i it was anything you know maybe it's just my it, you know anything in that office felt so staged to me like it felt like i was watching early dynasty you know it just i just couldn't i, I just couldn't get in into um how they were the, how they were setting up the power dynamics between these parties in this room uh, i i did not like that but but you're right i mean apollo creed is is, you know, he's a legend and he becomes a legend as a result of the relationship that starts here. Yeah. Um, and the fact that he says there ain't going to be no rematch is awesome as we lead into Rocky II, uh, <laughs> making him a complete liar. So uh, Burgess Meredith as Mickey, uh, I, I have a problem with this, too. Are you surprised? No, I do, too. I do, too. You do? Yeah, oh, I'm absolutely. delighted. What's your problem? My problem is that in my head. I, for some reason, always remembered this being kind of like the the real relationship in the film, kind of this bond that he had with his trainer. And maybe it's something that happens in the later films. But I ended up being kind of surprised as I watched it that I'm like, God, there's really no training in this film. Uh, he's this this grump of an old man who he's got this this great speech that he gives to Rocky, you know, when he's like, um, you know. I give me a chance. I want to I want to be your corner man. I want to train you, um, which I liked. I liked that he um, he had that speech and he had to kind of pursue that. I thought that was actually really nice. 
but uh, but there's no training. Like there's no real montage that I that I felt like I really got a sense of this guy being the trainer that I remembered and 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 creating this foundational relationship with this character that I remembered because I I just don't feel like that. Like once once he has that speech to Rocky and Rocky kind of comes out on the street and and that's the start of it all. Um, that was it. Like there's really no more of him. I'm like, what happened yeah. to? him as the as the trainer and again going back to our point earlier giving him that moment like don't let your anger uh drive you etc yeah. etc et i just felt like i missed all that yeah i that i i think that gets into my problem too which is that he is in in what he should be in the film is the mentor character right i mean he yeah. should be the character that uh that in fact you know what we would expect is that rocky has to go to him and beg him uh for his allegiance right beg him for his expertise and his wisdom please give give unto me that which i uh, you know that which i require and you know at at some point uh that relationship becomes comes to fruition and you know that it, it becomes something that is both give and take and and that's what we expect that's what we expect from movies that do this kind of thing and in this movie it doesn't happen that way it starts with they've already we have this presumption that they've already had a mentor relationship in the past and that rocky failed mickey by becoming a leg breaker uh for the mob and that mickey has given him up and that is symbolized through having his locker cleared out and put in a bag and and i i love that moment but it's just a it's a strange conversation that sets that up and then it leads us to mickey becoming an uh, you know for lack of a better parallel an, an ambulance chaser of coaches right i mean he is <laughs> he is coming to rocky and begging him to take him on as a mentor and that is bananas crazy that is, i just don't i i don't get it that whole conversation as which is a great example of two people uh, two performers giving great performances with material that doesn't make sense I can't, it doesn't make sense emotionally or intuitively to me, since when does the mentor have to come begging for the hero to take him in and teach him how to pass the threshold guardian? It just doesn't, it's not an archetype that works. <laughs> it's a square peg in a round hole. And so that that scene is resolved by Rocky <laughs> screaming at the wall and then running downstairs and shaking hands in the middle of a dark street at that extreme <laughs> long shot is just it's comical to me from a screenwriting perspective. And I don't know if that is just a sign of where Stallone was when he was writing that, he, you know, he, he just he hadn't thought through some of those mechanics, but it's one that doesn't connect uh, emotionally. It's, a, it, you know, tropes are tropes for a reason. And sometimes it's good to subvert those tropes. Uh, and, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes we need the trope to let us into some new uh, arena in, in the film. And I so that's that's what I struggle with. Uh, in this sequence, I think Mickey is is misused and we see him more of him later and we get more of him in in subsequent films. But uh, this one I had a hard time with. It's it was weirdly frustrating for me. It's it's an interesting an, an interesting route that they ended up going with that character. And part of it feels like 70s realism storytelling, like that long shot as Rocky comes out. I'm like, uh, that felt like a very 70s way to cut, resolve that scene. It was quiet, simple casual very casual they didn't make yeah. a fuss about it but i also felt like in a in a in a sports film like this is i feel like we just need a little more i agree yeah we got some other cast members we have not me uh, mentioned yet uh we have <laughs> interestingly we have joe spinell as the mob boss gazzo he was in the godfather i did not see that he's the guy who um uh shoots mo in the eye in, I believe in the oh no 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 wait is he the guy who shoots Mo in the eye or is he the one who locks the guy in the revolving door and shoots him there one or the oh, other oh yeah, yeah he's yeah. one of he's just one of the 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 you know hands that uh, yeah that uh, Corleone has yeah yeah uh so he's in this joe spinell he's great i think he's great he's a great sort of um you know he's a utility player in this movie as, yeah. as the mob boss right he represents the whole underworld <laughs> he and his driver and his driver is great uh i i just i love the little <laughs> you know uh tit for tat exchanges that he and and rocky have uh every time they they get together i think that's just a that's a joy um we also have uh, uh frank stallone 
uh, as timekeeper. Now, I bring up Frank Stallone not because of his role here, not because he is uh, Sylvester Stallone's brother, Andy, and not because he is uh, a, uh, a performer of some magnitude on his own in terms of his musical career. It is extensive. Um, well, even has the song Take Me Back in this one. Yeah, he does. He does yeah. have a song in this one. Uh, but for his the seminal work of Frank Stallone. <laughs> <laughs> is uh, in his portrayal of Caesar Mario in the film Hudson Hawk. Thank you, Frank Stallone, <laughs> for all you have given us uh, in in that that film, that cultural touchstone that is Hudson Hawk. Oh dear, oh mm-hmm. dear, it's coming. <laughs> Train's coming, Andy. <laughs> I yeah. No comment. Mm-hmm. Even mm-hmm. more exciting than that, though, is the fact that Michael Dorn appears as an uncredited bodyguard for Apollo Creed. Who I know, knew? Lieutenant, right, Lieutenant Worf himself. Uh, that is just fantastic. I think that was fantastic. And uh, Butkus Stallone uh, makes his appearance, uh, the eponymous appearance. His name is really Butkus, and he is Rocky's dog. Yeah. Uh, he was born in 1972 in New York City. He is an actor known for Rocky. He died in 1981 in Los Angeles, California. Oh. I love that nowhere in his IMDb bio does it actually say he is a dog. <laughs> You don't even need to know anymore. We've reached the state of equality. Um, uh, that is brilliant. Just James Crabb brilliant. is behind the camera. What do you think of his work here? You know, the movie felt very 70s to me. I really enjoyed, actually, the way that it felt. Yeah. Very realistic. I was going to say, in a good way. In a good way. Yeah, very yeah. gritty. Just it, it had that sense, that 70s feel, the long lenses, uh, or long takes, shallow depths of field. Uh, just the way that the lighting all felt very natural. It was beautiful. It was a really um, nicely put together film. I, I, I very much appreciated that, especially with a boxing film. And that's something else when you get to the the fighting matches. I, I think the editing and the cinematography tie so closely together and they both work very well in uh, in context of each other. I think so, too. Uh, James Crabb is, uh, has a, a fairly extensive uh, catalog of films that he's worked on. Um, and, uh, you know, he's got a nice um, set of films through the 70s uh, leading up to you. You have definitely seen him if you have seen any of the Karate Kid movies, uh, the original Karate Kid movies. Uh, he's behind uh, those First films. Those, he's yeah. also. Yeah. And with, uh, with, the, with the, our director here. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. We didn't even mention our director. Here. Yeah, we kind uh, of skipped over uh, we, we John skipped G. Appleton. Yeah. Uh, so speaking of that, what do you think of uh, Mr. Appleton's work? I, you know, I thought he was fine. Again, going back to that 70s uh, style, I think he captures it really well. And I like the way that he lingers on moments. It felt very nice, very natural. And I, I definitely appreciated that. I think it's interesting that uh, if you look at his body of work, and I, I don't know, honestly, as I look at his films, I think the only ones that I've seen um, are this and the uh, the first two Karate Kid movies. Maybe he for did the, keeps. He did the, you I haven't seen, seen the third one? He I never the saw the third I gave up on it yeah. after the second one. I heard the third one wasn't very good. Yeah. I might have seen For Keeps and I might have seen Lean On Me. Um, those are two that I feel like I probably did watch. I just can't remember much about. Um, but I think it's interesting that of the inspirational sports movies that he did, it's boxing and karate, which seem like, uh, well, and, and he went on to do more. He did uh, um, Eight Seconds, which was uh, bull riding. So the ones that he's taken on seem like the non-normal uh <laughs> you know, inspirational sports movies. Like it's not football. It's not soccer. It's not, mm-hmm. it's not baseball. It's uh, boxing, karate and bull riding. Yeah. Right. I appreciate that right. about him. I, yeah, I totally agree. And, uh, and we're going to do those. We're going to tell those stories in an, in an interesting way. I, it surprises me to say that, to hear you say that you think you've seen lean on me, uh, because that one in, you know, the, the catalog of all of the films that he has done, that's the one that, that really stands out to me. Um, it, it, you know, it was a, a very different performance from Morgan Freeman. And the fact that it was Morgan Freeman and Robert Guillaume, like, you know, Benson, that's what this was like. I think the first thing that I'd seen Robert Guillaume in that wasn't Benson. Uh, and that, that movie as a, uh, I think was, uh, it was terrific. I absolutely terrific. So, um, now, suddenly, I think we need to do a John Avildsen series. <laughs> we 
Well, he's got a lot of interesting things on his filmography that I'm curious about. I mean, this is his, well, I think like his 10th film that he's directed. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not like he was, um, you know, you know, one and done type of guy. So No, right. 10th yeah. uh, out of nearly 30. Right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, very interesting set of of work here. Yeah. I think we can't we can't leave this conversation without talking about Bill Conti and his music. The thing that's most interesting to me, first, I love the music. I, I love the music. It is exactly what I think we need uh, for this movie. I, it is just perfect and inseparable from the movie for me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, what I find so interesting about the music is it's so iconic. Like, it's it's some of the most iconic music that has been written for film. You hear the music, you know instantly what it is. You you instantly feel inspired. Um, everybody's probably heard their high school marching band play it. It works so well in context of the film. But what's interesting about it is it it's so iconic, but then it shifts in slight ways. And all of a sudden, like, wow, it is so 70s. It yeah. has so much that Bill Conti 70s music. And when you hear them singing Gonna Fly Now to that tune, you're like, wow, that is a really dated song. But mm -hmm. it still ends up working in context of the film. And I think what people forget, because the, the music is truncated almost everywhere, that they don't listen to the main fugue, right? The main theme in total and we rarely hear it until you hear the opening of the film where it it you know and then it goes on like it doesn't go to the ba ba right it, that's yeah. always cut for like commercials and for marching bands but it goes into this whole other kind of symphonic thing that that i think is you know it, at least that to me is is really cool and I, I like the whole thing but it's we forget because the music is so easy to to slice and dice in pieces and parts and use it for you know for all kinds of different um different things and and so uh, i think it's a great score i think you're right it's super dated but man does it ever fit this film and Conti it's, does a good job of work. taking that tune and, and slowing it down to create moments between uh, Rocky and Adrian, you know, where yeah. it's, just, it's, a, it's a very much more quiet version of it. I, it's, it's nice. It's really nice. Uh, can we talk about eggs? I, I saw this before Cool Hand Luke. This, I think, was probably the first time I ever saw anybody drink raw eggs. I don't think I even knew that that was something that was safe to do. And it just, it's still to this day. I watch it and I just, I, I quiver in, in just, just disgust because he's like oh no no don't do it don't do it do it <laughs> and he does and not only does he do it but he's a slob like he gets yeah. egg all over his shirt and i'm just like it's all over his hands because he's then just he goes kind out of for a run and he like yeah. sweats in the egg i'm like god you're just still eggy and oh it just it grossed me out it was very <laughs> funny the the thing that i have a problem with is not that he you know he does the eggs uh, it's that he does so many of them like in a row. Yeah. That scene Ugh. is so it, it's like strong for me because it's just one egg after another. And we're behind the refrigerator. And so all you see is him lit by the, the light of the refrigerator and just one egg after another going into that cup. And I just <laughs> it's just never ends. <laughs> Ooh. So gross. Oh, and speaking of food, I just have to comment. Um, now, every time I see Carl Weathers in a movie, I'm always wondering how much of the craft service he's secretly uh, filling his pockets with so he doesn't have to, uh, uh, you know, he can save money on his groceries and everything. Right. <laughs> That's become my new thing every time I see Carl Weathers now. <laughs> Oh. Uh, all right. So this movie, do we even need to mention sequels and remakes? I don't think so. Boy, there yeah. are a lot and we're going to be covering them all. But award season. Oh, yes. This is where it gets interesting. How did it do? Yeah, this was a very popular film um, and uh, uh, both popular um, with the crowds and also with the awards. 20 wins and 21 other nominations. Uh, I think it speaks to the inspirational nature of it. And for a first time writer, um, actor trying to make good with his career. I mean, this this story really, I think, was largely as much about Stallone and his determination to make something of a career for himself as it was about anything else. I mean, he had been in we didn't even talk about him really but like his his backstory he'd been in some low end movies nothing too big and um and no parts that were too big but enough and uh and then he's like he decided he's going to write this one and that he wanted to uh to star in it and that was kind of 
his big push for it. And it was a little bit of a, uh, a, a, you know, I think d- his determination, I think it reflected it quite well that he actually pushed to act in it and, and mm-hmm. wouldn't sell it unless he got t- to do that. And, and here it was, he, he did actually make that happen. And because he wrote this so fast, like three and a half days, he, he kind of wrote this after watching uh, the match between uh, Muhammad Ali and Chuck Wepner. And it, it, it just kind of inspired him. And, and uh, yeah, he, I, I think, made good on this. And, and uh, the fact that uh, he fought for the role speaks to the success of the character. You know, it's interesting on that point, uh, and just as a little uh, nod, I found this really interesting that, you know, he, he watched that, that bout between Muhammad Ali and Chuck Webner that you mentioned, and uh, that it went to the 15th round, and that uh, then he wrote this movie. And then later, Webner filed a lawsuit which was settled uh, for an undisclosed amount with Stallone, uh, even though Stallone says, no, 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 I, uh, there's, there's no inspiration there. But Wepner sued him uh, and said, yes, there was inspiration, and they, they settled. Um, I, I find that really interesting, that, that little bit of conflict in there about how this story came to screen, uh, and that Wepner as an athlete could sue for that story uh, for his performance in a boxing match. I, I don't think I'd ever heard anything like that. Yeah, it's not like a life story or anything. Yeah, right. And I just wonder if it's one of those things where they settled just to kind of shut him up and keep him quiet sort of thing. Yeah. Like, we don't, you know, yeah. we don't need to uh, drag this movie down with this sort of thing. And who knows, maybe they settled it because it was holding back production on the second one. Yeah, you know, maybe. I, I don't know exactly how that, uh, how that played out, but, uh, but I do find it very interesting. Um, that that all happened. Well, I think it's equally interesting uh, that, you know, especially given your uh, current personal uh, series uh, on Robert Redford, this could have been Rocky played by Robert Redford. Yeah. If he hadn't fought for the role. um, Absolutely. Yeah. It would have been very interesting to see it shift to a different actor because Redford, Ryan O'Neill, Burt Reynolds, James Caan, those were all people that United Artists thought should play the role. But uh, because of his ultimatum, Um, and you know, smartly, I think he, you know, he said, uh, he would never have forgiven himself, forgiven himself, had the film become a success with somebody else in the lead. And, uh, I think that was, uh, I think that he ended up with the right producers or Ir- Erwin Winkler and Robert Chartoff. They had a contract with United Artists that gave them the right to green light a project, um, without having to get permission from the studio, as long as the budget was low enough. So they did all of that and he got the part and history was written all right so meanwhile back at awards season back at awards season yes uh the oscars 10 nominations for this film i mean that just shows uh the uh the incredible incredible um place that it uh, found in people's hearts it won for four of them best picture 1976 best director uh, and best film editing. Sorry, it won for three of them. I don't know why I said four. Uh, best picture directing and film editing. Um, so we this I have a question for you as we continue. So how do we feel about uh, best picture? We've talked about four of the five now uh, from 1976. All the President's Men, Rocky, Network, and Taxi Driver. The only one we haven't discussed is Hal Ashby's biopic about um, uh, the musician. Uh, uh, why am I forgetting his name? Uh, Woody Guthrie in Bound mm-hmm. for Glory. Do you think Rocky should have won? No, I don't. I, I think both uh, for me, uh, both Network and All the President's Men uh, outshine Rocky as films. Um, it, you know, I, my hunch is you're probably on uh, Taxi Driver. No, I'm Network and All the President's Men all the way. OK, Taxi Driver, yeah. I, I think, is a, a, an amazing film. I don't know if I would put it in Best Picture. Um, uh, I, I don't mind it being nominated. I don't think I would have picked it, though. But certainly All the President's Men or Network. I would have picked above Rocky. But I think yeah. it speaks to the time. I think it largely yeah, speaks I, to I the inspirational feel of the film that just that sold people on it. Well, and, and you look at it. I mean, this is about building uh, building a human up, right? This whole movie is, as you say, it's the inspirational nature of the power of man. And all the presence men and network and taxi driver are uh, all films about breaking man down. 
uh, right? It's all about destruction. So of these movies, uh, you know, of course, the one that is constructive will will, you know, shine uh, outshine the one that is destructive in in popular culture, I think. So, um, well, Bound for Glory certainly is is uh, constructive. I know, but I feel like we can't. I don't I don't count it because it's i can't even remember that film I, i'm not well, entirely sure if i've seen it i i really enjoyed it i thought it was a great film great music obviously with with all of guthrie's yeah. songs very inspirational film uh, in, in a way it's very similar because it's about this this guy who was you know working on farms picking crops and but he was singing and he inspired uh just kind of the just so many of the poor people because he was like a working man singer and 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 he kind of just kind of created this this vibe this folk singer vibe that uh, i think really spoke to the people um but i didn't find it as inspiring as rocky so to that end i can see why rocky between the two would have been the one that would have found the larger um voting audience yeah i i think so too. okay all right so continue all right so moving forward the other nominations at the oscars uh sylvester stallone was nominated for best actor he lost to peter finch for network, which I can't argue with that choice. Not at all. Uh, interesting note here. Sylvester Stallone at this with this nomination does become the third person to be nominated for both acting and writing in the same year, following Charlie Chaplin for The Great Dictator in 1940 and Orson Welles for Citizen Kane in 1941. What amazing company for yeah. Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> yeah. Just that amazing. Is, that's amazing. It, the, these are things like when Rambo and Commando... And uh, all these later films that Stallone was in, uh, I lose sight of this with him. Yes. You know, there's this element to him that I don't feel I ever give enough respect to. Uh, I, I am very impressed with him. Uh, Talia Shire was nominated for Best, Best Actress. She lost to Faye Dunaway in Network, another one I can't argue with. Burgess Meredith was, and Burt Young were both nominated for Best Supporting Actor. They both lost to Jason Robards for All the President's Men. I can't argue with that. Um, between the two, I certainly would have picked Burt Young over Burgess Meredith, though. Um, Sylvester Stallone was also nominated for Best Original Screenplay. He lost to Patty Chayefsky for Network. Can't argue with that. Okay, nope. Best sound lost to all the president's men. I think just for the end as the typewriters build. I can't argue with that. Yep. And best original song, Gonna Fly Now. Um, surprisingly lost, considering how iconic it is. Uh, it lost to Evergreen, the love theme from A Star is Born uh, by Barbara Streisand and Paul Williams. Um, we're going to be talking about that one um, after this series is over. We'll be talking about the A Star is Born films. I'm interested in hearing that song and in context of the film and seeing if I what I think about that. I will say I'm shocked that Bill Conti wasn't nominated for best best uh, song best music. Me too. That's that in fact is my only surprise uh, at the Oscars that you know everything else you've listed makes total sense. Yeah, and what's interesting is you know if you look at the films that were nominated for best original score, we have The Omen from Jerry Goldsmith which won um mm -hmm. uh, wonderful music bernard herman's score for obsession bernard herman's score for taxi driver jerry fielding's score for the outlaw josie wales and lalo schifrin's score for voyage of the damned um wow the omen yeah. obsession taxi driver three incredible scores i i can't remember jerry fielding's uh, music from the outlaw josie wales but he is one of the 10 j's of composing for me so I, i'm sure i enjoyed it <laughs> voyage of the damned from uh, lalo schiffer and i don't i've never seen the movie i don't know what the music's like but just the fact that that rocky's not in here just still shocks me i yeah. absolutely would take one of those out and put it in yep me too yeah. And it's certainly more listenable elsewhere. than The Omen as much as oh, I love yeah. Jerry Goldsmith's music. <laughs> it's super creepy. If you want to have a great Halloween soundtrack, play The Omen music. But That's right. Uh, but I, I dare you to sit down and, you know, uh, do a little work. It's yeah. not great focus music. Yeah. Ave Satani, everybody. Jump on, <laughs> just to jump on board that train. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Golden Globes, it had six nominations. It uh, only won for Best Picture. Uh, the BAFTAs, it had five nominations. Interestingly, the awards of the Japanese Academy, it won Best Foreign Film. The ASCAP Film and Television Music Awards, in 1988, it was it won the most performed feature film standards, Gonna Fly Now. So it did, you know, it took 12 years, but it finally got a award for that song. Um, and then the David Di Donatello Awards, we've talked about them recently, um, the Italian uh, Awards. It won Best Foreign Film Actor, um, Sylvester Stallone. He actually tied with Dustin Hoffman for Marathon Man, another film we've talked about on okay. the show. Yeah, good company. Yeah, good absolutely. company, great period for film. How did it do, Andy, at the box office?
Well, uh, Avelson's and Stallone's little character boxing movie was a pretty small production, costing a million dollars to make, or $4.2 million in today's dollars. The movie premiered in New York City November 21st, 1976, and had a limited run until December 3rd, when it opened wide opposite Hal Ashby's Bound for Glory, which we just talked about. The movie was a sleeper hit, growing in popularity and eventually becoming the highest grossing movie from 1976, earning $117.2 million domestically and $107.8 million internationally, which comes out to $951.7 million in today's dollars. That is a huge profit for this little film, earning back 225 times its budget, and you can see why it spawned such a big franchise and made Stallone a star. The profit-to-cost ratio puts it as the third most profitable film we've talked about on the show, just behind Mad Max and Night of the Living Dead. As for the adjusted profit per finished minute, it comes in at number seven, earning a whopping $7.9 million each minute. That is a solid start to the franchise. And I guess, kind of like Star Trek, we'll see how it fares from here. Not bad. That's... Right up with Mad Max and Living Dead. Yeah. Indi- indie movie mu- budgets making a lot of money can't argue that you know that's right that's right well i am uh, really glad that we have this movie on the list i am uh uh, i i think that it is uh, it's a great thing just to have in the catalog but the fact that it opens the door to an exploration of this character and what they do with it over so many more films uh that are not all terrible right they're not unnecessary most of them and uh and they do interesting things and so i'm i'm excited to see what you think about them especially that that as as this is going to be your first run i i'm excited too and not just the the rocky balboa character but in a way also how apollo creed is going to thread his way through this it's going to be a very interesting exploration i'm very much looking forward to it and with that andy i think it is time for us to rank it let's do it Head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel and you will be able to see all the list of all the movies that we have talked about on this show. Uh, if you swipe over in your show notes and tap the word flick chart, that should take you directly to this movie where you can add it to your catalog and see how it stands up against ours. First up, we have two boxing movies and two 70s boxing movies. And interestingly, this other boxing film is another one that really I felt was a it, it kind of a pair with Rocky, and that is Fat City. Yeah, I would take Rocky. I I will too. Um, but it's just interesting, just the the kind of the seventies realism in both of these films. Um, very different tones, but Rocky will be my choice as well. All right. Next up, Rocky or Raise the Red Lantern. Oh, flick chart. You're amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I am going to say Raise the Red Lantern. Oh, uh, I think I'm going to go Rocky. Okay. Yeah. Here we go. One, I you oh, know you're I, not. I was ready to go. No, I, I, I you know I, I I'm I'm a little flexible on this one, so I'm going to give you Rocky. But okay, but uh, there's there's some magic to raise the Red Lantern. But I'll give you Rocky, Rocky or 101 Dalmatians. <laughs> oh no, I'm going to say Rocky. I I love oh, 101 okay. Dalmatians, but uh, and I love the Disney animation magic with that film. But um. I found a little more connection with Rocky. 1976 okay. battle. Rocky yeah. or All the President's Men. All the President's Men. Totally. All the President's Men. Rocky or Snowpiercer. I'm going Snowpiercer here. I will. Uh, I'll give you Snowpiercer. Okay. Look at that. I wasn't. For some reason, I wasn't expecting that. For some reason. I don't know why. Um, Rocky or Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Absolutely Close Encounters for me. Yeah. I'll give you Close Encounters. But it's it's tough. <laughs> We're getting there for you, huh? Uh-huh. Uh, Rocky or Up in the Air. I'm going to say Up in the Air. Yeah, Up in the Air. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> Rocky or Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. Absolutely Star Trek II. Star Trek, yeah. Well, my friend, that puts Rocky at number 49 on our flick chart. 49 out of 387. So it's, uh, it's not a, a bad pretty place good to spot. be. Not, not too bad at all. It's, uh, I, I, I was wondering how this one would fare. And it, it makes me curious how the rest of them were, will fare. Because I just, I don't, honestly, I don't know what to expect out of this franchise. I'm very curious to see where it goes from here. What, uh, what does that do for your personal ranking? 
My personal ranking, uh, you know, it's funny. When I first looked, it was ranked at 2115. Um, and that was just from my memories of it when I first saw it. But re-ranking it, and it landed at 849 out of 4,086, which is a 79%, or about four All right. stars. All right. Well, predictably, uh, this is a much higher. Well, it is higher on my list, I'll say. Uh, it landed at 63 out of 1,055, which is a 94%. Uh, if I were to go by the algorithm, uh, this should be four and a half stars uh, elsewhere. And I'm I'm leaning toward that. This has always been a five star heart movie for me. But I'm, I, you know, just because of of you know, what the whole series means to me. Um, and, and so I'm I'm tempted to just leave it there and not touch it. But based on our conversation and this watch, I, I it's probably more legitimate at, at four and a half stars. What do you think? For me, it's a four star, uh, four star and a like, though. Um... I I really uh, just was happy with this experience and uh, I did have issues with it, but um, but I still really enjoyed it. So four stars with a uh, heart. So that averages out to 4.25 over on Letterboxd. It'll land at, uh, at the four and a half. So there you go. Well, then I feel pretty good about that. That's where it should be. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, that's it for for this particular for our entree into the world of Rocky Balboa. Where do we go from here, Andy? Well, this is the franchise, so I am very curious uh, to see what happens in three years. Rocky II, 1979, uh, this is where Stallone uh, starts taking over as director. So I'm going to be very curious to see what happens here. This is the continuation of uh, kind of uh, his battle with Apollo Creed. So I've never seen it. Very curious to see how it all shakes out. Mm, let the games begin. Well, if you want to hear more of us, but you can't wait until next week's show, check out our new show, The Marvel Movie Minute, that just went live a couple of weeks ago. We're talking about the films of the Marvel Cinematic Universe one minute at a time, starting with 2008's Iron Man. You can support that show and all of our shows over on patreon.com slash the next reel, and you can get access to our exclusive members-only weekend show, The Saturday Matinee. We talk about movie news and new trailers, plus we go head-to-head in our weekly challenge in which we put together lists of movies related in some way to the movie we're discussing that week. There are all sorts of other goodies, too, if you support us at different levels. Just head on over to patreon.com slash the next reel. You can learn more about us and check out the detailed show notes at thenextreel.com. You can subscribe for free in your favorite podcast app and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter at The Next Reel. And if you want to get into the conversation yourself, join our Discord channel for a whole lot of movie chat with movie lovers from around the world. You can find the link to join in the show notes or on the website. The Next Reel couldn't happen without the hard work of Stephen Smart running Instagram, Ben Lott, who runs all things Twitter, and thanks to Eli Catlin, who graciously allows us to use his song Ragtime Instrumental as the theme to the show. You can find out more about Eli on his SoundCloud page. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. The kids have spoken, Andy. Oh, yes, they have. Uh, Thanks to the kids over at Common Sense Media who share their reviews of this particular film. uh, And uh, we've we've got some that that rise to the surface. Indeed, we do. Indeed, would you uh, would you like to do the honors? Yeah, I'll kick it off. Uh, you know, it's funny because this is a, uh, a 70s film and there's there's some things in there like I wasn't expecting because I did start watching with my kids. Like he's, you know, having to he's the muscle beating people up. He's uh, talking about horrors, all this sort of stuff. Um, mm-hmm. And and this is uh, this kid, 10 years old, has this to say. He says it's for ages six and up five stars, inspirational <laughs> and forever my favorite. When I watched this movie, I thought, Hey, this guy is cool. And then as the movie went on, I started to adore it. The quote, violence is actually a sport. And as for swearing, it's honestly not too bad. Yes, there is a makeout scene, but I think most kids can handle that. That's, that's his <laughs> review. Uh, he's 10 years old. And uh, yeah, you know, I guess I guess that's a okay. But that this 10 year old thinks that six year olds should be watching this movie. That's right. Yeah. Apparently so. Call that out. I've got a teen 17-year-old who says uh, one star. Mm. Oof. 
terrible. I almost fell asleep. I was not tired at all, and I never fall asleep in movies. You can't even understand what he's saying. It is a waste of time and money. Don't watch it. It's so boring. The whole plot is terrible. I can't believe it won an award. It also gets mentioned in Pitch Perfect. Watch that movie instead. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if your choice is between, this, this is like the flick chart uh, rating. <laughs> uh, also says that this title contains positive messages, positive role models, violence and scariness, sexy stuff, drinking drugs and smoking, language and consumerism. This review helped me decide. What I love about that is clearly the kids are the ones who get to decide what they say it contains. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's funny because like mine totally didn't pick those same things as the, uh, as the things that he says. He said it contains positive messages and positive role models. Yes. There you go. Yes. I love this website more than any we've come across. <laughs> this, it, it's really delightful there's one in there where the kids i i can't remember where i saw it but there's one where the kid actually outs the parents as uh like parents give it up this movie is not for kids stop showing it to kids <laughs> <laughs> kids tell it like it is like it is very funny mm. thanks kids it is hard to believe that we have been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. So many great movies, so many great conversations, but it's a lot of work. Producing this show week after week does require a lot behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. We had some great films in Season 8 that started their lives as books or plays, and you can find all of them on our Originals page at thenextreel.com slash originals. That's the site where listeners can find links to purchase all the source material behind the adapted films we covered from season one up through our current season. For part of season eight, we had a series celebrating the 50th anniversary of films from 1968. We talked about 2001 and 2010 for our Odyssey series, both adapted from Arthur C. Clarke's novels. Man, the second one was so much better than the first, right? Don't you even get me started. <sighs> Need I bring up Under the Cherry Moon again? Yes, also so much better. <laughs> wait, wait, no, that's not what I... <sighs> Planet of the Apes kicked off its series based on the novel by Pierre Boulet. We covered Danger Diabolic and The Detective, adapted from novels for our 1968 crime films. Wait, wasn't that The Detective the prequel to Die Hard? They were both written by Roderick Thorpe, and yes, it's the same character in the books. I can't believe they even asked Sinatra if he'd be in Die Hard. That would have been yeah. weird. <laughs> Uh, Once Upon a Time in America was part of our Leone Once Upon a Time trilogy, adapted from Harry Gray's novel. And we looked at 1968 Best Picture nominees The Lion in Winter, Rachel Rachel, Romeo and Juliet, and Oliver! We also had an Ingrid Bergman series with adaptations like Spellbound, For Whom the Bell Tolls, Murder on the Orient Express, and Gaslight. We haven't talked about Gaslight. Stop gaslighting me! <laughs> Dive deeper into these books and more adapted films at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every purchase supports the podcast. Get the full list of adaptations that we've covered on all the Next Real family of podcasts and start your next read today at thenextreel.com slash originals. Originals.